Yeah, I don't think Mother knew about this. Uncle Marvin was strangled by his own beard. Yeah, you never saw it coming. And welcome to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. And today's show is brought to you by BYU TV's Relative Race. Now in season four. Boy, they're doing some great stuff right now. Hey, Genies, nice to have you along. And if you're new to the show, this is the program where we talk about some of the stories people find, how they found them. And we'll give you a little instruction on how to break open your family tree and find the same types of material. And uh, coming up a little later on, we've got a great guest, well known in the genealogy field. She is Amy Johnson Crow, a professional researcher. And we're going to be talking about getting sideways ways with your family. Now, that doesn't mean the same thing that it does in the rest of the world, in the genealogy world. That's a good thing. And we'll explain why and what it means and why and how you should do it. And we'll explain that coming up in about 10 minutes or so. Then later in the show, this guy from Boston, very grizzled, he's going to be in studio talking about crossing the pond, finding stories from your ancestors, how they came across the pond, what the experience was of crossing the ocean, and how you can find and develop some of that material. It's a lot of fun. David Allen Lambert will be here. In fact, he's going to be here even sooner. Hey, just a reminder, if you haven't done it yet, sign up for our weekly Genie newsletter. It is absolutely free. You can do it through ExtremeGenes.com or on our Facebook page. And, of course, we never spam you. Just give you all kinds of great information, links to past episodes and current stories. You're going to love it. But right now, let us... Oh, he's right here. It's David Allen Lambert hey. in the studio with us today. <laughs> nice to see you, bud. It's nice to actually see you in front of me. Yes, yes. it doesn't yeah. happen that often, which is why we're going to do a bonus segment here a little bit later on with you. Hey, I'm glad I walked in. Pick that brain of yours. <laughs> but uh, right now, let's get on with our family history news. We've got a lot of good stories today to share relating to family history, starting with the greatest of all times, Muhammad Ali. This is going to knock you out. I'll tell you, the genealogical world has just learned that the great Muhammad Ali is actually the third great grandson of Archer Alexander, who was one of these people from history you probably wouldn't know about, but he is actually the model for the emancipation statue in Washington, D.C. Yeah, with Lincoln Mm -hmm. on that. Yes, it's somewhat controversial because it it shows Lincoln towering over this slave being, you know, lifted to freedom. But nonetheless, he was the guy, and that's the third great grandfather of Muhammad Ali. And it was discovered because one of Ali's third cousins did DNA and right. did the work and figured it all out. What a great story. It's it's unbelievable. The history that we find when we don't even think we're going to come across it. And of course, you know, I just hope that none of my third cousins find out any interesting stuff that I don't discover. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, by the way, didn't you meet Muhammad Ali a couple of times? Yeah, actually four times oh, I got wow. to meet him. And, and every single time, just a delight with anybody he met. He loved kids. He was pleasant. He was fun. He enjoyed himself. And it didn't matter how much people were pressing on him or demanding whatever it was. He was just one of the nicest people I've ever met. And I've met a lot of celebrities. And your kids met him, too. I remember seeing yeah. a video that you put out there that at the time when they met them. Yeah. They actually entertained him, and he gave him a hug and a kiss. Can you believe that? Wow. Crazy stuff. Pretty amazing. Well, the next discovery is kind of a little close to home. A young lady from Kingston, Ontario, Kim McFarland, did a DNA kit, like most of us have with Ancestry, and she got a match, a half-sister match, who's only five months difference in age from her. Oh, boy. Yeah. yeah and Dad's still living, too. Uh, yeah, uh-huh. that's that's what we mm-hmm. see. Uh, Dad's got some splaining to do. He does. He does. But it's proven that this is not so rare. This is actually one of the things that the girls were concerned about, that maybe Ancestry should give a warning. But, well, they actually have that option already. Right. You can opt out of have, making your results public. I think the biggest problem with the warnings is nobody really believes they're going to be the one to get that strange match. Mm-hmm. And so when they do, that's just such a shock. And, and we certainly experienced that personally watching other people. And you've even had a surprise find in your family, though not through DNA. 
Correct. Yes. I'm delighted that I have a half sister, Donna, who is put up for adoption that we never knew. And she's a welcome part of my family. And a shout out to Donna. I know you're listening. (laughs) Okay. So my next story is a little older. It's 3,500 years old and it goes out to Switzerland. And this is in regards to a bronze decorated hand that was found. It's not just a piece of a statue. It's probably the first known prosthesis. A prosthesis hand? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it looks like this person would have lost their hand maybe in battle or something. But, yep, retractable fingers and the whole nine yards. It looks like something that's from C-3PO. Wow. But, uh, yeah, it's quite amazing. So that is now being looked into. Who knows? There may even be more such discoveries in this yes. area. And and then kind of in keeping with this this ancient find, there was another one of a child in a in a burial situation way back from like 1500 years ago. This is amazing. Yeah, this is out in a Roman villa. This is a 10-year-old child, the not sure of the sex. He was found with a limestone rock about the size of a bird egg shoved into his mouth. And what they're pretty sure is he was suffering from malaria. So part of it was to keep away the evil spirits and to keep the dead from rising and also potentially to keep the illness at bay. So they're thinking it's kind of like a Dracula burial. Right. Incredible. Just in time for Halloween. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> My blogger spotlight shines all the way from Boston out here in studio to Loganology. Dot com, L-O-G-A-N-A-L-O-G-Y, where Marley has a great little blog about her family with some of her Scottish research that she's done. But she touches base uh, most recently on using Facebook groups for genealogy. And I've done that myself. I've talked about using a homestead, if you will, to kind of gather in all your cousins, second cousins, third cousins. You know, they may find that there's a statue of your ancestor that might be out there. You just never know. And of course, as always, if you're not a member of American Ancestors, you can join and use that coupon code. You know what it is, Fish. Yes, it's extreme. That's it always Which is has. What we are always has been, and yes. you get twenty bucks off, right? That, oh my goodness, you've heard this I knew before. It. I'm all over it. I'm well, all over it. I'm going to stick around because after <laughs> Amy, we're going to talk about getting over here across the pond. All right, coming up in just a little bit. Thanks, David. It's great to have you in studio. It's been a long time. All right, coming up next, as David mentioned, we're going to talk to Amy Johnson Crow. She's a professional genealogist from Ohio, and uh, she's going to talk about getting sideways with your family in a good way when we talk about genealogy. That's coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Hey, Janies, it is Fisher, and I got to tell you how excited I am to have Restore from Vivid Picks as a sponsor on the show. Now, Restore is a great software that fixes your pictures instantly. Think of it, just one click to bring those memories back to life. And it'll correct color, it'll correct contrast and lighting, and you'll wind up with nine different choices of fix to choose from. How cool is that? So all you have to do is scan your pictures and then take your choice and move on to the next one. That's how easy it is. That's why I like it so much. Now get this, you can go to ExtremeGenes.com and click on the link to Vivid Pics and use Restore to fix 10 of your photos for free. Yeah, it's a free trial. You're going to love it. Or you could also go to vivid-picks, that's P-I-X, dot com slash extreme genes. Hey, reclaim your fading memories with the Vivid Picks Fix. It's the Vivid Picks Fix at vivid-picks dot com slash extreme genes. Legacy Tree Genealogist is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've worked with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll free at 1-800-818-1476 or register online to get a free estimate. Right now, you can save up to $100 on professional genealogy research. But hurry, this offer expires at the end of the month. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. 
Hey, Genies, Fisher here with a shout out to our Patrons Club members at patreon.com slash extreme genes. This is where friends of the show support extreme genes for as little as a dollar a month, all the way up to the cost of a very nice burger each month. I mean, a really juicy one. You can support the show and enjoy various special Patrons Club member benefits, such as acknowledgement on extremegenes.com, special bonus podcasts from expert guests like Maureen Taylor, the photo detective, C.C. Moore, your genetic genealogist, great storytellers and experts on record sets from all over the world. We even offer expert advice on specific questions challenging your research. So go to patreon.com slash extreme genes and get signed up. We love sharing your genealogical journey with you on our Extreme Genes Patrons Club. After all, what would you rather have, inspiring and informative content or another greasy burger? The choice is yours. And thanks for supporting Extreme Genes. Hey, we're back. It's Extreme Genes, America's family history show, and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And this segment is brought to you by FamilySearch.org. And it was my recent pleasure to meet for the first time, after having heard about her for many years, the famous Amy Johnson Crow at the Federation of Genealogical Societies Conference in Indiana back in August. And, and she has agreed to come back on the show. Hi, Amy. Good to talk to you again. Hey, good to talk with you. Thanks for having me back on the show. You know, there's so many things that you write about that I really enjoy on your blogs. We had a conversation the other day about this idea of getting sideways with your family. Now, most people realize that that term tends to mean that you're getting on their bad side for one reason or another. But in the genealogical sense, we're talking a whole different way of looking at it. Yeah, it's definitely not getting on their bad side. It's actually just a a different way of looking at it. It's kind of a broader perspective than just looking at that one person in the family that you descend from. You know, I'm really into Civil War research. I just absolutely love that time period. And when I discovered that my great-great-grandfather had served for the Union out of the state of Ohio, I did a little bit more digging and found that both of his brothers had also served. So being the Civil War nerd that I am, I send away for all three pension files. Nice. Because, yeah, because that's just what you do. Right. Right. And this is what we mean by getting sideways. You're not just dealing with the individual. You're also looking at the siblings. Exactly. So when when I got all three pension files, I was fascinated to see what was included and what wasn't included in all three of the files. You know, because here we have brothers out of the same family, and they're serving not in the same units, but they're all serving from the same county. So backtracking just a little bit, my third great-grandparents came from Scotland and settled in Washington County, Ohio, where they had 11 children. Wow. Nice big, yeah, nice big family. Well, they had 11 children, from what I could tell from census records and from the the will of my third great-grandfather. Well, I start going through these pension files, and I discover that one of them, one out of the three, had abstracted the family Bible. That family record out of the family yeah. Bible where it's listing all of the births and, and whatnot. Well, and, and in that era, did. there were very few local areas that recorded births and deaths the way people did in their own family Bible. That That's where it was it, kept. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, he was born in Ohio, but in a time period before Ohio was keeping civil birth records. Well, he needed to prove how old he was to get an increase in his pension. So what does he do? He takes the family Bible to the local pension office. The pension officer makes this beautiful transcript of the family record, and they have a nice notary signature on it. You know, it's all nice and official. But in that pension file, it mentions a 12th child. And this child, a little boy named William, only lived a few days, but he was born and he died between censuses and before Ohio was keeping civil birth and death records. So now if you've, you've had, hopefully completed the family. Yeah, it's complete as far as that family Bible appears to be and from what other records I have found. But I just thought it was fascinating that out of the three brothers and their very robust Civil War pension files, 
only one of them had this family Bible, and it was only in that family Bible that listed that other brother of theirs who sadly died in infancy. Boy, and this is why it's so important to look at those siblings. I had a similar thing back in 1968. My mother approached my dad's aunt, who would have been, uh, gee, I guess she was my great aunt. And she provided all kinds of little family history notes from her memory that proved over the decades to be very useful. And she sent them just a few months before she died. And it mentioned in there the married name of a sister of my great, great grandmother, who had been a brick wall for decades. When I started to work on this side of it, figure, boy, if I could find out about this sister. In fact, I stumbled upon a record that mentioned the name Full loon in a record that also <laughs> contained my great great grandmother and I'm going wait a minute that was the name in aunt Mamie's notes so I started tracking this woman and then found the sister and from a result of that she lived longer than my great great grandmother to a point where the death certificate started carrying the names of the parents in New York City so when my great great grandmother had died in Brooklyn in 1879 there was no such place for the names of the parents but by 1900 Hundred, there were. And so it gave the name of the sister's parents, which, of course, were the parents of my second great grandmother. And when I found the christening of the sister, I got the maiden name of the mother and then was able to find all the children that were christened, including my own second great grandmother. So that took me back not only that generation, but also one more generation to the parents of my great great grandmother's mother. So it was really useful to find the sister and not just work on the direct line. Yeah, exactly, because each child in the family has the potential of creating records that are going to give us the answers that we're looking for. Like like you said, that one sibling who lasted long enough to live into an era where they had really good death records and gave you that clue that you needed to move back another generation. But if you had focused solely on your direct ancestor, you might still be beating your head against that brick wall. <laughs> I think you're right, because it went back over to London, and, and it was just very difficult. It's always hard to, to cross the pond, I think. Yeah, and when you do have a situation where you're wanting to cross the pond, you need to do as much research as you can on this side. Yep. And that includes researching that extended family, because you're going to need all of the clues that you can to make sure that you're researching the right person over in the other country and not just someone with the same name. Boy, I think you hit it right on the head. And you know, Amy, one of the other sides of researching the siblings is the fact that sibling stories often have to do with your direct ancestors. So if you found some distant cousins that might have some oral history or some stories in their lines, you could discover some stories in there concerning your people directly, which I think would be really important. Oh, definitely. And I think sometimes when we're thinking about doing an oral history or, you know, just talking to someone in the family, you know, we hear the advice so often, and it is good advice to approach the people in the oldest generation. Yep. You know, if you're fortunate enough to still have somebody in a generation further back than you are. But sometimes I think we get so focused on generation being that direct ancestor, like, well, you know, my, my, grand, my grandmother isn't still living, so I can't interview her. But could I interview her sister, who is still living? Sure. You know, could I interview her brother? And I think we also need to expand it a little bit, thinking about, like you said, thinking about those cousins. I'm actually the youngest of 12 grandchildren, and my older cousins have completely different memories of our grandparents than what I have. Sure. Grandpa died when I had just turned six, so I have just a precious few memories of him. But in talking to my cousins, you know, I hear the story about how every year he dressed up as Santa Claus and hear the stories of what he would do around the house and just how jovial he was and like, oh, you know, kind of makes me, you know, a little sad that I, I didn't get to know him better. But I think we need to pull out some of those stories from 
people even within our own generation, but who have a different perspective on things that that we have and things that we've experienced. Because no two people are going to see the event exactly the same way. Right. And especially generational, right? I mean, a child yeah. looks at an adult a completely different way than, say, a sibling or a peer or a friend, because mm-hmm. they, they experience them as adults, obviously, and have that adult-like relationship, and people are different around children. And it's, it's fun to hear how they were in their different roles within life. Right. And I think it's so neat if you can find someone who knew your ancestor younger than you remember them. Yeah. You know, I, I look at pictures of my dad, and it's like, wow, dad? <laughs> you yeah. Were, you, yeah. You it's were like, young oh, ones. Dad, yeah. yeah, you were young ones, and you had hair. Um, <laughs> and talking to people who knew him when he was in high school or when he was just starting his business, it's something that obviously I would never be able to experience firsthand. And sometimes, you know, even though I can still ask dad different things, Sometimes it's interesting to get someone else's perspective. Well, no kidding. Because, and the other yeah. side of this is is that dad doesn't necessarily remember all these other things. You know how it goes. Everybody has a little oh. collective piece of memory somewhere. But, you know, really what we're getting down to here is that no person is an island. And they have experiences essentially in relating or having experiences with other people. And when you can find those people who can share those memories, you can get some just golden stories. And it's really fun also when they disagree. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> just how things oh, were. <laughs> totally. And you get me together with my two sisters, and we start talking. It's like, well, now here's what happened. No, this is how it really right? happened. And the third one, yeah. And trying to figure out, okay, which one of these? really is correct and usually it's a little bit out of each one because as you said we all have a different perspective on things and we all have just different memories how we remember things what was important to us at the time can also affect how we remember it and you never know what you're going to come up with when you start getting sideways with your family and work on those sibling lines and find their stories and also find their records great stuff amy thanks so much Thank you. She's Amy Johnson Crow. You can follow her at amyjohnsoncrow.com. Lots to think about there. And coming up next, have you ever wondered how your ancestors did coming across the ocean? What were the stories they experienced? What ship were they on? What happened during that journey? Well, David Allen Lambert, the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org, is going to talk about that with us coming up next on Extreme Genes. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chartmaster's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chartmasters today at FamilyChartmasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chartmasters will give the greatest care to your family history. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. Zap the grandma gap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. 
Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Anna Vast, welcome back to Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show at ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, with my good friend David Allen Lambert. He is the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. You know, and David, we've been talking about this concept of, of researching and maybe collecting stories about your immigrant ancestors as they cross the pond. And there's so much to find relating to this. I'd never really thought about this till you brought it up. Well, I mean, I think we all start with our genealogy with stories. And I think sometimes we get the stories before we have the research. Right. So, you know, <laughs> we hear the story about somebody getting seasick, which is what I heard. My uh, grandfather and his younger sister came over in 1911 from England on the Empress of Britain. Water was going over the top of the boat. It was heavy seas and they got sick. So a little nausea goes a long way because that's a story that stuck out from my childhood. And I thought they came over when my grandfather was eight years old. They came over when my grandfather was nearly 10 years old. So, so a little different there. I was looking for the wrong date. So sometimes you have these stories that add color, as disgusting as it might seem to think about seasickness as sure. being part of your, <laughs> your only snippet of your family's adventure to come across to the new world. But think about it. If we had these stories for the Mayflower passengers, I think I know somebody who has somebody yeah. who came over over nearly 400 years ago. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that because I think my Mayflower ancestor had the best story about crossing the ocean, and that was because he fell overboard. Yes. And as we're talking about John Howland, and I know I know many of our listeners are also descended from him. He has, I think, the second greatest number of descendants out there. Mm-hmm. But coming across the ocean, there was a big storm, and the, the ship was being tossed to and fro, and there was a break in the middle of it, and everybody was down below, and you can imagine how it smelled down there. Oh. All these people, uh, this would have been in 1620. Right. And so John, sensing the break, decides, hey, I'm going to go back up on deck. And he does. And this monster wave comes and jerks the ship sideways and he's thrown into the drink. Right. And the next thing he knows is he is 10 feet underwater and he's just flailing around down there and he feels the rope from a halyard mast hanging in the water. He grabs it, pulls himself back to the surface and using a boat hook. The crew of the Mayflower pulled him back on the ship, no doubt with great scorn. Oh, I'm sure. (laughs) And he went back down, and he went on to marry and have 10 children and 88 grandchildren by the time he and his wife died. And this is why they put pools on cruise ships, so people would not decide to jump overboard and go for a swim. Exactly. Well, the stories that come are just amazing. I had another great, great who came across in 1882, and in the journal on the ship, it talked about how someone had died and they buried them at sea. Yep. And I'm sure he had to witness that. And, and, you know, you don't think about these things. You just think, well, he got on the boat here and he got off the boat here. But what happened in between? Well, you know, it's funny. Um, during World War I, a lot of the passenger ships, like the White Star Line Olympic, which was a sister ship to the Titanic, that transported my great-grandfather and his units across from Toronto, Canada, all the way to England. It was decorated with camouflage. But, you know, I would just know the name of the ship. But no, they're war diaries. So they talk about the longitude and latitude and where they are and if they spotted any U-boats, the whole nine yards. It's, it's really detailed. So you can occasionally find diaries people have written down. Or Betty at postcards they sent. My friend who was on the Titanic, Melvina Dean, who was the youngest passenger, when she came out to Boston one time, she showed me a postcard her mother mailed from Cherbourg, France, when they had picked up the last group of passengers before they were going transatlantic, and it's postmarked the RMS Titanic. Wow. Yeah, so, I mean, we don't even think about trips now. You know, you get in a plane or a train or we just drive— But think of the anxiety our ancestors must have leaving all that family behind. And how are they detailing this? I mean, I almost feel jealous when there are people that have family that have come over in the past 100 years because they have stories. A majority of mine came over in the 1600s or the 1700s. Right. 
I don't have any stories like that. No, because the records aren't usually that strong. Now, the Mayflower is kind of uh, an exception to mm-hmm. that because there was a great documentation of the entire experience for the pilgrims and the strangers and all those who were with them. But you think about it. I think a lot of people who, who say, wow, I, I can't go back that far because I have a lot of recent ancestry and it's tough to get things, say, from Eastern Europe. But what a history you could put together if you just collected the stories of the trips across the ocean and made a little collection of that. Right. And not everybody came into the port of New York. I mean, they think of Ellis Island. I mean, before Ellis Island, as you know, Castle Garden. Castle Garden, yeah. But there are other ports. Boston, Philadelphia, Portland, Maine. I mean, New all the way Orleans. To, right. And I mean, how about the person that was tracing their research and thought that their ancestor was going to come into New York? And it was New Orleans. New Orleans. And, yeah. and that's to me, is a mind blower. I mean, it's rare, right. but it does happen. And, they got and, on the wrong boat. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you said New York they had the, and it was New Orleans. They had yeah. the ticket folded. Right. They didn't see that's the other it. side. <laughs> <laughs> and there was the language barrier occasionally. Too. Yeah, maybe that was uh, the case. But nonetheless, they had to find their way north pretty quickly. So I, I guess our listeners, if you have stories about your family coming over, and it's not obviously written in the passenger list, it's not written in the naturalization record. Have you written it down? If not, why not? It's right. so important. Share it with your kids. I mean, if you're an immigrant yourself and you're listening, how did you get here? Sure, you may come out on a plane. Maybe you did come out on a boat. But write it down. Firsthand recollections of yourself or your parents or grandparents. That's a golden treasure of genealogy. And, you know, we were talking to Amy Johnson Crow a little bit earlier Mm -hmm. about getting sideways with your family, interviewing siblings and aunts and uncles, not your directs themselves. Maybe they're gone. But a lot of those stories will live with those people. True. And you have to preserve this. We have such great technology now. Like well, and the, the records of the ships and the military ships, and there are photographs, too. I know Ancestry has a lot of the photographs of the ships that brought our ancestors across. There is. There's a great book that's still in print called Ships of Our Ancestors, yes. but you can use something as simple as Wikipedia. Just put in the name of the vessel. I mean, you may find that there are more than one vessel over the years with the same name as your ship. I mean, how many Mayflowers have there been? You know? Right. I mean, so that's the type of thing. You can find an image of it, uh, and if you have an elderly relative and you know that they're the one that came over even as a child, get the story and pass it on. You know, And it's it's so important. It's something that once these stories are lost, they're lost forever. That's it. And, and you know, I think a, a lot of people, it's amazing to me because I've always embraced these stories. It's amazing to me how many of these stories are lost. You know, the, the thing I often hear from people when I talk to them is, oh, I wish I had asked her that question. Oh, I wish I had known at that time, you know, what, how much I would miss this. But you grow into it. Well, right. I mean, even as a child, when I interviewed my grandmother, who was alive till I was 11, I mean, I asked her the birth, marriage, and death questions. What filled into a chart? I heard other stories, like the one about her dad being on a whaling ship. So that's kind of a vessel story in its own right. But I don't have any of the specifics, but you don't know what her parents did or did not tell her. Sure. So sometimes it's lost a generation before the one that you're interviewing. Yeah, there are so many. What other sources are there, David, to find out about ships of, of the ancestors? Well, obviously, if your ancestor applies for a citizenship, you get the date of arrival and generally the port. And then all you have to do is look at the manifest. I mean, and so many of these are online now. Sure. Between Ancestry and uh, things that Family Search is put online for free. You can get into so many of them. The Ellis Island website, Castle Garden, you can go on and search for people. That's right kind of combined really, isn't it? And it should be. It is. Uh, And like I say, just knowing the difference between the two, when you go out to get your boat across to Ellis Island, remember where you're getting your ferry from is where they were before Ellis Island. That's (laughs) right. Castle Garden. At the very south end of Manhattan Island. And that's the battery. Mm -hmm. The other thing you can use is newspapers. If you know that somebody came down on, uh, say, a boat from Canada, as some of my family did, look at the uh, local papers and see the arrivals. I mean, you'll see the boats that are arriving. Or maybe, even better yet, find an ad for your ancestorship or buy something on eBay, like a menu that came from the ship. You can get that stuff. Yeah. It's out, or postcards. It's out there. It's great stuff. Great conversation. Thank you so much, David. My pleasure. Good to see you. Tom Perry's next Talking Preservation on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show.
Ever wonder where you got your bright green eyes or your infectious laugh? Thanks to technology, discovering your family story has never been easier. And we're bringing it all together at Roots Tech, the world's largest family history conference. Registration for Roots Tech 2019 is open. Join us February 27th through March 2nd for this incredible four-day event at the Salt Palace Convention Center in Salt Lake City, Utah. Learn from over 300 classes on topics such as DNA, capturing family stories, and preserving legacies. For a limited time, take advantage of promotional pricing. Purchase a four-day pass for only $209 if you register before January 25th. That's $90 off a regularly priced pass. Explore over 200 exhibits in the Expo Hall and interact with the latest technology. Join the excitement, join the fun. Discover your family, discover yourself. Discover Roots Tech. February 27th through March 2nd at the Salt Palace Convention Center in Salt Lake City, Utah. Register today at RootsTech.org. Hey, Genies, it is Fisher, and another day, another episode of Relative Race Season 4 on BYU TV is in the books. And this was a particularly fascinating episode this past week week as Team Green, Paris, and Precious found themselves in New Orleans visiting with a cousin of Paris. And as it turned out, she too was adopted and was trying to find her bio dad. And Team Black, on their way to Casey, South Carolina, had quite an episode on the road, and you're going to want to see that. They also got to play some flag football with a cousin. Team Red, meanwhile, was in Montville, Connecticut, where Michael got to meet a blood brother for the very first time. Hey, all three teams are still in it for the $50,000, and they're all having incredible experiences meeting family they never knew they had. Check it out on BYU TV, Sunday nights at 9 Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific. Of course, you can also stream it at BYUtv.org or using the BYU TV app. It's free. Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a power new mobile app experience. That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for documents doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org/treeapp to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org/treeapp to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. It is time to talk preservation on Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. I got Tom Perry with me on the line from TMCPlace.com. He's our preservation authority. How you doing, Tommy? I'm super duper, thanks. You know, it's really interesting. You and I were talking a little off the air about this. We've heard so much about millennials and not wanting things, and yet we're finding out that the physical and analog and all these old-timey things are coming back into the realm, and that certainly has something to do with family history and preservation, does it not? Oh, absolutely. In fact, like we were talking off air, you know, our mad scientist Marlo from Heritage Collector, his software now, he went and did some surveys with all of his people to find out what direction they wanted him to go the most and what they were the most interested in. And analog calendars were number one by a big, over (laughs) 70% of the people wanted analog calendars. Meaning physical, right? I mean, something they could actually hold, maybe somebody could unwrap at Christmas time. But of course, there's also a digital component to that because you got QR codes on there too, right? Exactly. It's the best of both worlds. But like you say, people want to feel something nowadays. They want to actually touch something that they can actually see, and they don't have the old photo albums. So this is a great way to bring all of your different pictures together by making a calendar. And it's not just like 12 pictures. You can have multiple pictures. You mentioned the QR codes. So for instance, on Christmas, if you know grandma and grandpa are in Dothama, Alabama, and you're in Phoenix, Arizona, you can have a little QR code and let the kids use your smartphone 
and click on the QR code, and it'll be Grandma and Grandpa singing, you know, Merry Christmas or Happy Birthday or Anniversary or whatever <laughs> you want, which is just so crazy. Yeah, it really is, because it connects right to uh, a website that provides the videos that you do ahead of time. I mean, that's 21st century calendars and the best of both worlds. But audio is also moving in that direction as well. You know, we often talk about interviewing ancestors, older relatives, and getting their stories, but there are a lot of people who like to sing or perform music. And oh, a, absolutely. And a lot of folks are now going to the analog side of things. In fact, I had a buddy of mine who had a very popular band back in the late 1960s, and he decided to get the boys back together. And they went and recorded in a studio in Los Angeles with 1960s-era equipment, tubes, and 1960s-era microphones. And the sound is remarkable. And there's something, I think, with a richer quality to that old analog feel. Oh, it is. In fact, that's the exact reason that analog vinyl records have come back so much. They have a certain feel or flavor to them that you can't get no matter how well you master CD, no matter how well you do all your transfers, you know, it's still a digital medium. When you have those analog microphones, which are the old tube microphones, you record everything onto an analog tape. You take that and edit it with the old way that we did with the scissors and such. Oh, boy. And you can go and make things that just have such a neat feel and flavor to them to give you the old vinyl thing. You know, I have a friend I was just talking to on Facebook that was just doing a new arrangement, and his newest synthesizer he was using was 15 years old, and the oldest was 31 years old. (laughs) <laughs> All this old analog stuff, even in synthesizers that are digital, in the old days, they still had that analog quality to them because they weren't, like, overly digitized. And the sound is just so wonderful. And, like, two microphones, not only were they really, really expensive, they're some of the bigger companies that are actually remaking two microphones now because the studios want them. They're very expensive to make and very expensive to purchase. But they just have this rich sound that if you want that, that's the only way you can go. You know, it's interesting because there's a company in California right now that all they do is produce vinyl records. Yeah, vinyl. Wow. And, and they have a $10 million valuation on this company. And they're very small and very new. But it just makes you wonder, what's the ceiling and is this really a niche? But we do know one thing. It's an option now. All right, Tom, we're going to take a break. And when we return in three minutes, what do you want to talk about? Okay, after the break, let's talk about these really cool gifts that we can give to people as Christmas gifts that are all based on analog. All right, coming up next on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chartmaster's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chartmasters today at FamilyChartmasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chartmasters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multi- Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to transferduplication.com. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family 
History Research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for the Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's Top 10 Tips for Beginning Genealogists from the Chief Genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. We're back at it for our final segment of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show at ExtremeGenes.com. This segment is brought to you by Legacy Tree Genealogists, LegacyTree.com. Tom Perry's here from TMCPlace.com. We're talking preservation, but of course, and, and this strange renewal of physical things, of analog things. And we're talking about Christmas gifts, what you might anticipate. Tom, you mentioned calendars a while ago, and that's really kind of fun and intriguing when you think about it. A physical calendar maybe hanging in the kitchen and then you can actually scan a QR code and get a video from your grandparents or an aunt or your kids or whatever it might be. I mean, that's an amazing mix of the old and new, but we're not limited to just calendars. In fact, one of my favorite things to do is recipe books because mom had recipes, grandma had recipes, yeah. great grandma had recipes. In fact, sometimes they're handed down through even more generations. And this is cool because you can do it either analog like we talked about or you can do it digital. So you want to get these and make PDFs of them and you always want to get the card or whatever it's written on and make a copy of that even if it's in grandma's handwriting they can't read. But then always you want to put it down where you can read it. So you've got this really cool picture of this handwritten index card, and then underneath exactly what it is and maybe the story behind it, like why did it say to do this? Why did Grandma use this? When Grandma said a pinch, what did she really mean? And you put really cool things on it. If you're creating a PDF, you can print it out so you still have something physical. And I've even seen people do CDs and put all these on a data disk, but then they wrap the CD in photos that they've made of the old recipe books. Or you can go and get a binder and put these in the sleeves on the front and the back of the binder and then put things inside as well and then get a sleeve that holds a disc. Then the people that want to do digital, they've got it. The one that want to do analog, they've got it. And this is a priceless gift to give for Christmas and the different holidays that are coming up. Wouldn't that be fun to do a QR code actually showing grandma or mom actually putting this recipe together? You flash the QR code and it takes you right to the website with that video if you're lucky enough to have them around still to show you exactly how it was done. Oh, that's absolutely wonderful. In fact, taking it another step, you can actually, if grandma's gone, kind of dress up in oldie clothes and shoot it. And then when you go into Photoshop or you're editing, you know, make it grayscale or turn it into sepia tone and put the little scratches in it and change the speed so it looks funky and do little things like this on a QR code. And it would just be so much fun. It will be hilarious. And everybody will have a good time. And Nobody's going to give them a better gift than that. Well, let's see now. we got calendars. We've got recipe books. What else is in your little book of tricks here, Tom, for the holidays? One of my favorite ones to do also is storybooks because you can take recipes and put in them. You can take pages out of certain people's journals, like if Dad kept a real good journal. Take out the pages where he was talking about, you know, Brother Mickey and make a book for them of all of his journals when he was talking about Mickey. Make one for Sister Sharon. And with the new technology, when you put it into, like, Word or something, you can do searches and find the words and say, okay, for Jimmy's, I need page 48, 62, 81, 104. And it's really easy to get those and put them in PDFs if they want it digital or actually print out the form. So you have this really cool storybook that has all these journal entries, have the recipes in them, have special photos, and you can tie all these things together and just make a gift that is just priceless. And you can go to a local copy center and make it into a hardbound book if you want to, or go digital or do both. Wow, you're making my head explode again. You do this all the time on a regular basis. Oh, absolutely. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tom. Great suggestions, great ideas. The old is coming back to merge with the new for a whole unique kind of gift experience for these holidays. Talk to you again soon, Tom. Thanks so much. You bet. My pleasure. 
Hey, if you missed any of today's show, make sure you catch the podcast. You can find it on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, ExtremeGenes.com. It's everywhere. And, of course, you can download the free Extreme Genes app as well. Don't forget also, if you'd like to support the show, sign up for our Patrons Club. Go to Patreon.com slash ExtremeGenes. Hey, we'll talk to you again next week with some more great guests. Thanks for joining us. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Family.